So here I was, all ready to do a piece about the challenges and the solutions of landing heavy payloads on the red planet right after I got through with my live stream and everything was going well, all systems go, and then all of a sudden, just before things took off, everything sort of fell apart. At first, my streaming app told me to turn my phone sideways for a landscape view, although it was already turned sideways, which caused me to react in sort of an agitated manner, and so I rebooted, tried again, had the same problem occur, and so then my reaction became a little bit more agitated, and then after a couple other tries, during which time I lost the volume, etc., finally it got going and we had 90 minutes of a very pleasant discussion. So, the topic that we discussed, which was voted on by our generous Patreon members, was the challenges facing Mars colonization, which I thought would be good to follow up with a video on how the hell we would land on the surface of Mars in the first place. And by the way, what I'm showing you now is the Curiosity rover during its fiery descent into the Martian atmosphere, because the Curiosity is the heaviest thing we have landed on Mars thus far. Now thrusters on the back of the aero shield were initially used to orient the craft so that it would be able to deploy the Curiosity pretty much where NASA wanted it to go. And of course it had to require a pretty damn good heat shield because even a descent through the thin Martian atmosphere was sufficient to heat it to over 2000 degrees Celsius. And parachutes were deployed subsequently to this, the largest parachutes that NASA had used to this point. However, it still was not enough to decelerate the Curiosity to a point to where it wouldn't crash into the surface. So to keep NASA from losing millions of dollars in a pointless exercise, they deployed what was called a sky crane, which was complete with thrusters which decelerated the rover even further. Now these braking thrusters also serve to maneuver the rover to a safe landing site so that when finally the location had been established through the aid of a sophisticated radar system, the rover could be deployed in a location that didn't have any unpleasant obstacles like major boulders or anything else that would foil the landing. And so by the time the crane was ready to drop the Curiosity down to its final landing site, it was about as safe of a deployment as NASA could have achieved under those circumstances. So, maneuvering thrusters, unparalleled parachutes, a sky crane, all to deploy one ton to the Martian surface. And by the way, NASA declared that they had been incredibly accurate in their landing site, only 2.4 kilometers from their original goal, which is unparalleled in the history of Martian landers. So the question is, how the hell are we going to land something like the Starship, something that huge, accurately and safely on the surface of another world? I mean, even though SpaceX has proven to be incredibly accurate in their ability to land their boosters essentially any place that they want them to go, that's because they've had the advantage of constant communication with our global GPS system. Without that, they wouldn't be able to manage anything remotely resembling this kind of accuracy. So how are we supposed to do this on Mars? Well, it's through a method that I like to call the SpaceX Starship Suicide Dive, and we're going to cover that in just a couple of minutes. Hello, and 
and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. I am currently recording this in the wee hours of the morning after a bit of a family issue that has delayed my release of this video. I apologize for that, but it's coming in right after the live stream, which I think is a very good thing. A quick catch up. You folks have been absolutely astonishing. I have more than 90 Patreon members at the moment, and some of you folks have contributed significantly more than the amounts recommended in the tiers. I'm very grateful to all of you, but nevertheless, there's one of you that uh, insists on remaining anonymous that's contributed $200 a month, um, at least for the next couple of months. That makes an enormous amount of difference. Um, in addition, there's donation of sound equipment, which makes a big difference to a lot of you people. That is coming. It is subject to the slow and agonizing methods of the post office and Amazon, but nevertheless, it is coming. Also, background set. Um, we're going to be having a crew dragon on set, courtesy of Spaceship Mania and also from a local, well, an American 3D printer who I have recognized in the description. Um, so please go there and take advantage of what they have to offer and don't forget Angry 10, the 10% discount. And finally, one particular supporter who did allow me to recognize him, and boy does he deserve it, um, is a fellow named Christopher Lee, who came in at the Starship level $100 a month for 13 consecutive months. So how do I know that he's actually going to follow through with 13 months? Um, well, because he gave all of it to me in advance. <clears throat> In any event, um, I, I honestly don't know what to say. It, it is totally astonished me that you folks have been so supportive of what I do. Um, and I'm giving back in any way that I possibly can. The advantages are listed on the tiers, but they do include, of course, the opportunity to participate in the questions and answers and also to vote on the topic. So keep that in mind, although everybody is welcome to watch the live stream. I'm always going to keep it that way. All right, all of that having been said, let's go ahead and move on to what I like to call the Starship Suicide Dive. And no, that's not some new slam dancing move. Or do they call it moshing these days? We begin our story in Death Valley, California, where NASA is currently testing a system that in my opinion will be invaluable to precision landing on Mars, whether it be the Starship, or in this case, the Mars 2020 rover. Now this system essentially allows an automated landing system like the Starships to duplicate what the Apollo missions were able to do. That is, look out a window, compare the terrain to what their map said, and land in what appeared to be a safe location. But instead of using an astronaut gawking out the window, this system uses something called terrain relative navigation. And here's how it works. First, the ship takes photographs of the area where it's going to land. It compares those photographs to the information gathered by our orbiters over a great deal of time and then diverts to a different location if necessary in order to make a precision landing. After exhaustive testing, this system has reduced the margin of error from a few kilometers down to as little as 40 meters. So how could this system be used to allow the Starship to make a precision landing? Well, first of all, let's talk about the Starship suicide dive. As the vessel approaches Mars and enters the atmosphere, that's when things get different than just about any other kind of landing that a large ship has attempted. Now, the lunar starship, as you're seeing here, intends to make a fully powered landing. That is to say, use thrusters and propellant in order to set down safely and under controlled circumstances on the lunar surface. But you don't have that kind of luxury on Mars. 
Why is this? Well, it's all about speed and transit time. The propellant required to get a lunar starship to the moon in three days would take over a year to deliver a starship to Mars, which is, of course, a completely unacceptable amount of time. In order to get the starship to Mars within six months or less, you're going to have to burn off a lot more propellant. And this isn't just because Mars is a lot further away. Way. It's also because the planets are in motion as you're trying to make the journey. And as this animation from the NASA MAVEN probe indicates, the shortest distance between Mars and Earth is not a straight line at all, but a line that takes the orbits of both planets into account. It's a very substantial amount of distance, and if you want to cover that distance in six months or less, you have to burn up the vast majority of your propellant in the initial burn and then reserving only a small amount of propellant for corrections and maneuvers upon arrival. So since the Starship won't have a lot of propellant available for deceleration, this is where the suicide dive comes in. The Starship hits the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds in a blazing inferno and then ultimately passes through max Q or the speed of sound, levels off at subsonic speeds at 25 kilometers and has three minutes of that subsonic flight making adjustments with its reaction control system as it tries to find a good landing site and then it's going to have to make quite the radical maneuver. Since parachutes would be completely ineffective on a vessel this size, you have to use the atmosphere, almost every bit of it, in order to decelerate enough. And these three minutes of subsonic flight are possibly going to be the most critical during the Starship's entry. During this time, the Starship will use something like terrain relative navigation to establish its location, make sure it's closing in on the correct landing site, and then look at this maneuver before it sets down in the appropriate spot, hopefully within about 40 meters of where SpaceX intends. Now, if you're off target and one of your landing legs ends up in a gully or on top of a ridge or something along those lines, as you can see, very tall ships tend to not be very forgiving of any sorts of mistakes like a collapsed landing leg in this particular example. There are some very good logistical reasons to have precision landings. I mean, can you imagine if the cargo carrying starships were to land on one side of these ellipses and then the crew carrying starship were to land on the other side? Wouldn't make things very easy for the newly arrived colonists. But precision landings become even more important if you have flat landing pads, almost as flat as the ones that SpaceX uses today, waiting for you on the Martian surface, which is what rockets like these designed by the Masten Corporation are intended to do. Using engineered particles injected into the rocket plume, these little guys can create a hardened coating over either the lunar regolith or the Martian regolith in order to create a flat landing pad. A small fleet of these reusable rockets could create an environment that's much safer for the Starship to land on, both flat and also devoid of any materials, dust, or debris that a landing Starship might kick up, potentially damaging nearby structures or other Starships. So perhaps this dive is not so suicidal after all, utilizing all of Mars's atmosphere in order to decelerate until the last possible moment and terrain relative navigation in order to make sure that your landing is precise, hopefully on a flat landing pad, created perhaps by the first starship that arrives on the Martian surface, you might have both an efficient and relatively safe procedure here. But Mars does have one ace in the hole that could prove to be a serious problem for any Martian landing. 
Yeah, I'll bet some of you saw this coming. Dust storms on Mars, in my opinion, are one of the greatest threats to our colonization efforts, especially when it comes to landing. But I'm not talking about the big global ones. Small regional dust storms can cause problems too. They can change atmospheric conditions in ways that we don't anticipate. Plus, they can wreak absolute havoc with any sort of visual navigation system like the ones that I've described in this video. I pulled this photo from a paper linked in the description and it illustrates just how much a small dust storm can obscure a landing site and the shadow it creates can cause problems too. As a matter of fact, dustier than expected conditions caused the Spirit rover to overshoot its landing target by 10.1 kilometers and Opportunity by 24.6. Imagine what that would mean to the Starship. Now chances are such storms would only present an occasional threat to a landing, but nevertheless it would be foolhardy indeed for us not to gain a greater understanding of these storms and how to predict them as our efforts to colonize this planet continues. Otherwise, one of our starships may indeed make a suicidal landing on the surface with disastrous results. But the solution to precision landing on Mars may end up being the most obvious one, and that's for SpaceX to build their own GPS system around the red planet as time goes on. Only after something like this is completed can they be assured of carrying out reliable and precise landings like they do today on Earth. So, I don't think it should come as a great surprise to any of you that Elon Musk's plan to land the Starship on the surface of Mars is as extreme a plan as you could imagine. It requires that everything goes absolutely right. It's not nearly as controlled as the methods that he uses to land his boosters or even his plans to land the Starship on the moon should the Lunar Starship plan go through, which I certainly hope that it does. This is going to be far more complicated and far more risky, but certainly doable from both a physics and aerodynamics standpoint. It is possible, but it's going to be very, very difficult to test until SpaceX actually tries it on Mars. It seems to me, at least part of me thinks, that it would be better if somehow SpaceX could pull off a powered landing on the surface of Mars, much as they do with their boosters on Earth and as they're planning to do with the Lunar Starship. But that would require entirely too much fuel, right? Well, there's another way of doing this that is going to be coming up in a future video. And no, this isn't my idea, but it's an idea that's been circulating around and there's a couple of things that have been going into the Starship design that is leading some of us to believe that this might be what Elon has in mind. Anyway, there's your spoiler, your teaser for the next time. So until then, stay angry about space.